All right. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the second installment of the CU Boulder Visiting Artist Lecture Series for Spring 2021. The next lecture in this series will take place on March 2nd with artist Mark Salvatus. Please visit the Art and Art History website for more information about this historic program and all upcoming presentations. This presentation will include the artist talk followed by a short Q&A moderated by me. Please feel free to type your question in the chat box to the right of the video on YouTube at any time or once the talk has ended. My name is Marcella Marcella and I am a first year MFA student in the painting and drawing area. I currently have the honor of showing artwork alongside this evening's artist, Suchitra Matai at Union Hall in Denver, where Suchitra is based. She is a multidisciplinary artist who was born in Guyana, South America, and has since lived all around the world, including in India, Nova Scotia, New York City, Minneapolis, and Philadelphia, where she received an MFA in painting and drawing and an MA in South Asian art from the University of Pennsylvania. While her practice includes a wide range of materials and ideas, her primary focus is on the role of land and environment in the creation of identity. So Chitra incorporates cultural artifacts and the landscape she portrays in an effort to alter the scene's original meanings. Through painting, fiber, drawing, collage, installation, video, and sculpture, she weaves narratives of the other, invoking fractured landscapes and reclaiming historically rich objects, many of which suggest a colonial past or domestic purpose. So Chitra has exhibited her work internationally and is in the collections of Crystal Bridges Museum, the Denver Art Museum, and the Taylor Art Collection. Upcoming exhibitions include a group show at Icon Gallery in New York City in two weeks, a group show at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, and a little later this year, solo shows at the Boys Museum and with Building Bridges Art Exchange in Los Angeles. Without further ado, Suchitra Matai. Thank you for being with us, Suchitra. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you to the Department of Art and Art History, and thanks to everyone who is joining us right now. Um, as Marcella said, I am a multidisciplinary artist. I am going to expand a little bit um, on her definition that she presented to you or her description of my practice. I, uh, you know, think of myself as having a mixed media approach and I'm really interested in uh, the role of memory in unraveling and reimagining colonial narratives. So that's pretty much been my focus uh, for a while. I, I consider my practice to really uh, be interested or I am interested in giving voice to people who were, whose voices were quieted before um, in the past and whose voices are currently quieted, such as uh, women and people of color. I look a lot to my past and I, I consider my work to be both often narrative and autobiographical. Uh, I wanted to start uh, by talking a little bit about where I'm from. Uh, Marcella mentioned Guyana. It's a strange, not a strange, but a small and perhaps strange country that's very hard to describe. It, uh, it's on the continent of South America on the east side, right above Brazil, but it's separated from the rest of Latin America by the Amazon rainforest. So it has very little cultural connections uh, to South America. Mostly it has cultural connections to the Caribbean. So when you think of uh, countries, Caribbean countries like Trinidad, it has, it has more resonance with a, with a country or a place like that. My ancestors are from India. Uh, they were poor and they were, I want to say, lured by the British during colonial rule to work as laborers, indentured laborers specifically, on plantations uh, in Guyana. So they were poor in India. And when slavery ended in the Caribbean, uh, 1830s or so, um, the British really needed a labor force. And so they looked to their biggest colony, India. They also looked to other um, places as well. And Guyana, you know, has a population that is uh, of 
British ancestry, African ancestry, South Asian and other Asian countries. Um, and many others. So it's a very diverse place. I was born there, but I moved with my family, migrated to Canada and all over the US. I've also, like Marcella said, lived in India and Europe. And I feel as though all of those diverse experiences really feed my work. I think that, you know, when I when I reflect on my the history of colonialism, it's it's become not just autobiographical, but the autobiographical aspect is a way of entering uh, that dialogue about colonialism. So I'm going to share my screen here. I apologize, but for some reason we can't do a slideshow. It's on my end, so you'll have to see the images in this way. Uh, this work uh, I'm going to start with it's called indentured and it, all the work I'm showing you is about five years um, old. So this work is five years old, everything else will be more recent. I started with it because I wanted to talk a little bit about how I started as a painter. And I think people often ask me this, how, you know, how does painting relate to my practice now? I mentioned that I'm a mixed media artist. Uh, and I, I say that because no materials are off limits for me. Um, you'll find that I use a lot of uh, materials associated with craft or domestic processes. And that's because uh, when I was younger, I learned a lot of those processes from my grandmothers, one of whom was a seamstress. And so I learned to sew, to embroider, to crochet, um, to do to make to make to make work that was really considered craft. And Using those processes is not just a way of using something that I know and hold dear, but it's also a way of giving voice to artists, to creatives who weren't given voices before. And so when I transitioned or when I started expanding my practice to include other materials, it, I naturally went to fiber um, as one of those elements. So this work is called Indentured and I used a found macrame which I then wove into with other materials such as ribbon and um, other fiber and faux plants and created a scape um, that was both um, continuous and broken. And so a lot of times, you know, I think a lot about um, the fragmentation that is associated with migration and displacement and how one can think about identity in, in, in its most complex of terms. And so in the beginning when I was painting, a lot of the work I made uh, were landscapes and I really tried to create these disorienting spaces that could somehow reflect um, my experiences uh, as an Indo-Caribbean American. So in this work, um, it's a larger installation that has um, a smaller embroidery work um, and then creates, an, there's an expansion of that work. So the, there's a micro and a macro relationship to the scape and the, the work, you know, encompasses or, or is made of paint, tape, string, chalk, uh, you know, the, the idea of impermanence is another really important factor uh, in my work. There's actually a quote that I'd wanted to share before I introduce my work, and I'm going to read it to you. It's by the amazing Louise Bourgeois, who is a heroine of mine. She says that art is restoration. The idea is to repair the damages that are inflicted in life, to make something that is fragmented, which is what fear and anxiety do to a person, into something whole. I found some connection uh, with that quote to the feeling um, of isolation and disorientation that one feels uh, as an immigrant. I often use fragments of furniture in my work uh, that also to me speak of the domestic uh, and relate back to some of those processes that I was speaking about. 
in this work, it's called, uh, I called it Promised Land. And the video is, there's a video projected uh, within this headboard. The video I actually was able to take on the Middle Passage. Uh, of course, the Middle Passage uh, being, or the Transatlantic Passage being uh, related to the slave trade and the trade of indentured laborers. I was able to cross this passage on a ship and I, I took video knowing how dear it would be to me. And the whole idea about the work is, is creating this sense of um, a space, a portal where one is maybe has a desire for a homeland, uh, for connecting or reconnecting to a homeland, but then also um, this sense of uh, congestion that you might have felt um, on these small ships that people traveled on. An interesting story about my, my own great grandparents and, and grandfather is that they, you know, they traveled from India on a very small ship. The idea was that you would have work, work the land on a plantation for five years and then be able to um, either buy your passage back to your country of origin, India, or, uh, be given a small plot of land. So after the five years, my grandfather went back with his parents to India, but they were very poor and of a low caste. And I think that once they returned, you know, there was this desire, this longing. And then once they, they actually returned to the homeland, they realized that they were no longer considered pure. And not that they ever really were, but they were no longer part of the caste system. And so they actually made the journey all the way back to Guyana where they made a home. And I think this happened with a lot of people. There was a certain um, kind of, uh, you know, ultimately a separation or a break with the caste system that the, um, you know, economically poor and lower caste Indians could have. So as you can see, I use a lot of found objects in my work. And the objects often have an, an aura or power for me. They might be, um, you know, an old, like in, in this particular collage, uh, there's an old uh, colonial etching that I actually found and then reclaimed to create a story or a narrative that was very different um, or heightened uh, that story or narrative that was there embedded in the original colonial print. And the idea for me is to bring attention and awareness to the invisible. So people who, again, were not given voices, uh, slaves, laborers, et cetera. I also think about, um, you know, you'll find in a lot of my figurative work, uh, this is a found needlepoint. Um, combined with embroidery and that I did along with bindis that Indian women wear. And so a lot of times I'm piecing together all of these disparate parts in order not just to tell a, a different story, um, but also as a form of reconciliation. And so I'm, you know, I often think about all these various sort of cultural reams within which I exist. And a lot of my practice really deals with piecing those things, those disparate uh, aspects together and making them whole. This work is called The Past is Present, and it was a way of creating a dialogue between some of the more intricate works that I was creating with some of the prints and needlepoints that I was uh, working with. So the centerpiece for this work is this work, which I call Castaway. I took a found needlepoint and created a completely different narrative by isolating the figure of the child in the center. I then pixelated and created a, a backdrop of that image, almost um, erasing it, and then recreated a new narrative or a new dialogue with all of the smaller works in relation to the bigger work. I often use uh, found patterns that are considered tropical in nature um, as a tongue in cheek way of thinking about how the West thinks about the Caribbean. 
so I, I, I might add, I consider myself a Caribbean artist, but an Indo-Caribbean artist because, um, you know, I, I grew up, uh, you know, as a Hindu, watching Bollywood films and eating Indian food, but very much feel uh, a part of the Caribbean uh, narrative as well. But what I wanted to do with these found patterns was create or reveal a story that was once there, but never told. So these are women who might have, um, you know, who existed maybe in my family or um, at large and never were able to tell a story, tell their story. So whether it's through paint or embroidery, I find them interchangeable. Um, I work, uh, you know, sort of um, with all of these uh, elements. This work is called Mala. And I, in the center, there's a video. I'm sorry that I can't share that video with you today, but it's a video of a very stark uh, Nordic scape. And the rest of the elements are crocheted uh, or found scarves. And a mala is a garland that one wears, you know, in, in Hindu ritual ceremonies. But what I wanted to create was more of a womb. So this mala became a womb and there was an inversion of body and scape still thinking about the landscape, still thinking about my earlier work, but moving more towards uh, figure and body. Oops. Having problems playing this video. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this work um, was, I, I wanted to create this place, this space that um, was seemingly an interior space, uh, but that was something that adequately described that feeling of displacement, what it was to lose your sense of place, your sense of self, your sense of identity, uh, to leave a home, to not have a home. And so what I did was I, I, create, I used all of these very, um, you know, uh, antique, the sort of furniture of the era that I imagined uh, my family to exist in, and then uh, projected these, uh, you know, elements of landscape onto the furniture. So there are, you know, secrets in the dresser. There are, there's the, the middle passage projected onto the back dresser, and then an aerial scape on the hanging furniture. And so there's a sense of not ever feeling um, steady and, and always feeling unsettled. I mentioned that Guyana was half Amazon. I'm really, uh, you know, all, I mean, always thinking about the scape, the places that I've lived in and uh, this is an imagined scape uh, of, the, of deforestation in the Amazon. I wanted to create an, um, you know, an homage to uh, that space and to really think about um, what is happening in Guyana and other countries in South America. The last two works and this work were in a, an exhibition called uh, Sugarbound at the CVA in Denver part of uh, MSU Denver's, uh, well, their, their gallery. I, it was my first exhibition where I looked at the process, um, at the plantation economy and thought about it in relation to my own biography. And so in this work, there are 77 flasks with sugar of different colors. And I, I call the work skin because I really started thinking about you know, the, the kind of um, hierarchy of skin color in the Caribbean, also in India and also everywhere. You know, in India, there are skin lightening creams that people use um, to make themselves lighter. And, you know, in Guyana too. So there are, there are all these levels of um, uh, 
uh, you know, issues surrounding uh, race that uh, this work deals with. But it also deals with a colonial history because underneath those flasks are, uh, it's the universal standard encyclopedia. And I, I chose that in particular version because this idea of a universal standard was really interesting to me. And there are 77 uh, books and 77 flasks for the number of years uh, that Guyana was under colonial rule. I, I think a lot when I, well, when I find these found objects, sometimes I find them and they immediately need to be used. They need, you know, I find, I find a place for them in my practice immediately. And then other times I find that I find these um, objects and I know that they will um, have resonance for me at some point. And uh, this was one of those. So these um, metal pieces, uh, objects from a factory became harnessed. I called the work bound um, because to me it reflected the sense of uh, indenture, but it also to me uh, with the negative space in the back and the graphite drawing suggested our ties, our uh, ties to our ancestors and to our history. So more recently, I've been working a lot with fiber in a larger scale. And this was the first tapestry that I created. I made it, I called it El Dorado after all, because Guyana was considered an El Dorado, so the, the land of gold, the, myth, the the mythic land of gold. And you know, there's a the way there's a way that memory functions uh, in our minds that is really interesting to me, and that is the conversion of memory and myth. And so what what is real, what is not real, what is remembered, what is remembered through photo photography, what is remembered through history, um, you know, what is history? And so I guess memory allows us, you know, I mentioned to unravel that history and, and reshape it when we start actually delving into our own past. This work was called uh, A Matter of Course, and it's a large organic fence um, you know, I, I've used fences and borders in my work before, and this was one uh, way that I was able to integrate that idea into a tapestry. So I used a fence and then wove uh, fabric into that fence. And the sari in the work, um, the garb that Indian women wear, is my aunt's. So uh, two years ago, I was invited to... Um, be a part of the Sharja Biennial. And it was probably the largest project I'd worked on. And this, uh, this project required, uh, for me, multiple elements. And because I had the scale and the budget, I was able to create something that really reflected some of the ideas I'd been thinking about on a grander scale. So the first step was the tapestry. And I, I went to Sharjah on a site visit, and I realized um, that there were a lot of South Asians working, um, you know, uh, lower level, uh, not lower level, but jobs in labor. Um, and I know that there are some visa issues and things like that surrounding their stay in the Middle East. Sharjah is in uh, the UAE. I did some research um, and I, I realized that I wanted to make a work that felt like a monument to them and in a way realized that their relationship to labor was very similar to my family's. And so um, these are, this is a tapestry. They're individual tapestries, actually. They're, this is five of the eight I made and they were comprised of saris vintage saris all used and worn and of the body um, from all over the world. So from my own family, uh, from India, from Sharjah, uh, you know, from Guyana. And I wove them into um, a, a rope net to create this sense of continuity among diaspora, among the people of the diaspora. So I saw this aspect of my biennial work uh, to really be um, a way of connecting women 
over land and through time and women of the Indian diaspora or the South Asian diaspora. I incorporated those saris into this larger work, which included a merry-go-round found object from the region uh, that was um, found in an abandoned uh, play playground. And I wanted to have this sense of um, uh, not play, but of innocence that worked with the video I'm going to show you in a second here. So the video I took, it's a compilation of border walls. So I went to uh, the border between Palestine and Jerusalem, and I went to the border between the US and Mexico, and then I used prison walls, and I created um, uh, an abstract, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to say, um, sort of palimpsest of, of walls. And so the idea to me was that there was mobility in diaspora, but a lack of mobility or, um, you know, that, that, that was created through the, the wall, which is obstruct, you know, obstructs the movement, the free movement of people. And so the idea was how, how do politics um, and, and political boundaries affect the movement and uh, the movement of communities, but not just the movement, the existence and being of the individual and communities. So I mentioned that I use found materials and sometimes uh, very serendipitously, you find really interesting um, things. So one of my friends gave me this bag one time uh, I think this is Rebecca Vaughn, who uh, I think is going to be a visiting artist uh, or, vi or a visitor, le visiting lecturer uh, at your university. And I, she had no idea what was in it. She said, this is for you. So I opened it up and I realized that there were these tapestries um, that were in balls that were basically from museums that where they could no longer be reconstructed. They were just balls of almost string. And so I reconstructed the tapestries. Um, Someone mentioned that this one might even be from the 1700s and, and then created, uh, omitted some of the figures and brought focus to other figures within the tapestry itself, uh, thus reconstructing the narrative. I, I've also started using objects that have uh, a lot of meaning for me um, or that are my own. And so in this one, this is my first sari that I, I took a section of. Um, and then, in, you know, uh, incorporated it into the work. This work is called Demerara Dreams. Demerara is the, um, the county that I was born in. And I left Guyana when I was quite young. And so I wanted to create a work that spoke to the feeling that I, or the feelings that I remembered, or the aesthetic and the experiences I remembered when I was there. So I actually used my mother's sari in the work. And uh, this work will actually be in an exhibition at the AGO, the Art Gallery Ontario, uh, this year. Just gonna flip through a little quickly. Um, you know, thinking about invisibility, I was also creating uh, figurative works where um, I used embroidery as a way of creating uh, a figure that was there but not quite there. This one's called Wedded, Wedded Bliss and it's taken from a photo of my own of my parents on their wedding day. It's a little hard to see. So after creating uh, with the saris I found it to be a medium um, that really spoke to me, that really allows me uh, to think about diaspora and migration and scale. Scale is an important aspect of my work. I find that I move between uh, you know, small and large and I, uh, the saris allow me to really think large, largely, or at least I, I've um, been able 
to use them in a in a very uh, large way. And so there's there are infinite possibilities with the saris that I that I love, and I am I've been creating sculpture as well with them. This is a, a work I made last year that was this called Calypso Queen, Calypso being the music. Uh, from the Caribbean that uh, I grew up listening to. And I wanted to use an image. I have these photos from the 70s of family members, and I wanted to uh, make a heroine out of one of them. And so in this work, I'm using this very Baroque, you know, rog tapestry, and then revealing this figure that was always there and, and giving her voice. I made a series of these. I always think about the that middle passage, it keeps coming back to me. And so um, I, I use it as a an image. There's an image that's sort of like in my mind that I, I can't let go of and I I come back to it. I've also created installations with saris uh, braided and they become almost like like hair. This one's called Ac um, Axis uh, Mundi and I was thinking about Hindu myths but uh, you know but I think global myths about the connection between heaven and earth and um, it also becomes hair and it becomes uh, figure. So when the tapestries from Sharjah were returned to me, they were uh, in a very um, sad and glorious state. I say sad and glorious because they were completely faded and falling apart, but I found them beautiful. They had uh, a sense of age that was really interesting to me. And destruction and deterioration. And so uh, for Crystal Bridges Museum, I, I was in an exhibition there this year. I created uh, new tapestries that combined um, what I call normal vintage tapestries with these uh, more you know, forlorn tapestries and created a, almost like a landscape um, through, through the space. And so this one is about 45 uh, by 15 feet. Through the pandemic, I've found myself um, making a lot of work, uh, mostly because there is nothing else to do, but also because I'm a frenetic maker and kind of can't, can't stop. I think when I realized five years ago that my practice could be something else and that perhaps that something else could more adequately reflect the things that I wanted to say, that I found that it was a, almost like a, an awakening. And so uh, I find myself sort of vigorously making uh, every day because I, I'm just, I'm really excited. And, this is a large scale painting based on a Hindu myth. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly looking, drawing from my own cultural resources and sources. And, um, you know, I also look, you know, I mentioned I'm, I'm interested in the period of co colonialism in, in Guyana and the Caribbean. I, I research that period. I, I, you know, I read scholars of that period. Uh, but I also trust a lot in my intuition. And I think that is a really important part of art making for me. I think that. There are a lot of times when, as artists, we get in our heads, and uh, it's it's difficult to make. And I I allow myself to experiment. And and for some people, maybe that's a bad word. I've 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 learned for some people, but for me, it's it's everything, and it's it's how I want my practice to be intuitive, you know, with uh, sort of overarching. Uh, or underlying thesis, uh, but the making, in the making there's freedom and that freedom comes from trusting your intuitive uh, senses.
So I've, been, I've created different installations with the saris. This was a work where I, um, it's called We Are Rainbows, We Are Shadows, and it incorporates different fiber elements, including jute, which is really, I think of like the kind of um, bags and materials in the Caribbean, but then also hair curlers and uh, saris and a, and a scarf that uh, my friend gave me uh, that was hundreds of years old. I actually get a lot of objects from friends and family or even strangers who send me uh, send me things knowing I will make something with them. This one's called Scorched Earth. Uh, during the uh, riots uh, or the protests in Minnesota, I, I was actually visiting and on my way to Minnesota, I have family there. I took a lot of video of the pastoral landscape, but then I, I had video also of the protests against, uh, not against, in, in uh, response to George Floyd's murder. And I created this work uh, with both videos. I'm sorry, I don't have the video to share. So I've been thinking a lot of, of how you know, to take that colonial history, to take that deconstructing of it, and to feed it into current conversations about race and power. And this is something that I'm, I'm constantly doing. It's not so much about just taking apart that history and looking to the past. It's doing those things in order to fuel um, a present that we want to see. And then I'm just going to show you some really quick images of recent installations. And here I'm using the garlands that you'd find in Hindu rituals, or I should say plastic versions of them. This one's called uh, Mother, uh, what is it? No, uh, Mother's Tongue. Tethered, which is in the show at Union Hall with Marcella and others of you. And I'm just going to end on this work um, and tell you a story about it. The scarf. So my grandfather, you know, was born in Guyana and never went to India. But we all, my whole family has this, uh, looks to India as the motherland. So when he was in his 80s, he decided he needed to go. And he went very um, urgently, so no one really could plan to go with him. And he was obsessed with a uh, Sai Baba. I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but he wanted to go see this, this guru. So he went with a group of Guyanese people and they all wore these bandanas. And so this, I created a work uh, in homage to him. And I don't think of it as nostalgic. It's more of like, it's, a, it's more of an assertion and a recognition. And um, the work is made with European toile. And uh, I've created figures within it that are um, non-European and then incorporated uh, embroidery uh, as well. So I'm going to end there, I think. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much, the teacher. That was um, so inspiring. And I, I'm i just dying to see more of your work in person. It was almost uh, maddening to have to look at it on the screen. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat now. Um, I'm going to kick it off with my own question. Um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about um, how you define art versus craft, or if you draw a line between those things. Um, also specifically, like in the context of feminism, your artwork to me is, seems very like deeply feminist. And it's, you know, again, it seems like you're using craft um, kind of to bring uh, feminist ideas into your artwork. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you think about the hierarchy of art versus craft 
also, you know, kind of in the context of feminism and the way we think about craft as like a feminine thing. Totally. And I, I, uh, I touched upon it, but I didn't, yeah, I didn't delve enough into it. I use those processes as an assertion, right? I mean, and, and, and then when I also, when I use found objects that are needlepoints or that are embroideries, that someone else made, I really see those as a collaboration. And I mentioned that it's a one-sided, you know, I don't know if I mentioned, but it's a one-sided collaboration, but it's, it's less, you know, to me, it's more of like presenting those beautiful, amazing works that women made, um, people in the domestic sphere who couldn't be a part of a larger conversation and, and making that work, not just the process, not just the activity of it, but the actual works that they made a part of that conversation. So there's very, I, I don't see a divide between art and craft. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that, um, yeah, I guess with in terms of the materials, there's no divide and my work is definitely feminist mm -hmm. for sure. And I see it, I see it that way. Yeah, um, a little follow-up question to that. Do you ever receive any kind of pushback around that, you know, from from the, you know, capital A art world? Um, or do you, do you feel like that craft aspect of your art is like really being embraced? Yeah, I think it's funny. I think, you know, I, I've been art making for quite a while and I think that when I, when I was in grad school, the only artist that I knew that incorporated embroidery, well, there were a couple, but probably the most famous one was a man. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he kind of um, would make these large paintings and then have some embroidery within them. And I think it was a big move. Um, I feel as though nowadays, nowadays mm -hmm. I don't feel that there is as much pushback. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, I don't care. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? I think that you have to use materials that are true to your process and to your practice. And and if people don't find them to be part of it, you know, then they might have to rethink what art is in general. And I feel like that's kind of the obligation of an artist, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, totally agree. Um, okay, so I have some questions here for you. Um, Allie would like to know, um, she says, I love when you said you're a frenetic artist. What does a normal work day look like for you? Um, it's, all, it's all sort of the same because I don't really stop. I, I have a family. And I like to think that I'm a good mother, <laughs> um, but I also don't stop. I don't stop thinking about or making work. So I, I have a studio. I'm here at, right now, but I also have a studio at home. Mm -hmm. And you'll find me on my sofa embroidering or, you know, just old school doing my work in my living room, you know, all mm -hmm. the time. And so I guess I just work all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I feel that you just kind of find a way. And if it can, every, any nook and cranny in your life, you can be making it and you making it. Yeah. yeah, you're making it, you're thinking about it, you're reading, you know, you're doing everything that it, it, that feeds it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, Corey would like you to, um, okay, here's his question. Can you elaborate more on what you were saying about experimentation, um, especially with how do you balance experimentation with production? I think there, to me, it has to all be experimentation. Mm -hmm. So if I don't know how to do something, I YouTube it or have someone teach me, and I try and I, you know, and I, I think so much of my practice is about using things that have been discarded, you know, and that if, if I do something and it doesn't work completely, I make it whole anyway. I try, you, you know, I, I, I do other things to it. I, I, I consider ha accidents happy. And so if you have that attitude, then all your work is experimentation. 
-hmm. And there is no distinction between production and experimentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciated that you, you know, kind of commented that sometimes people think of experimentation as kind of like a bad word or, you know, something maybe artists shouldn't be um, bothering with. But in my experience, it's kind of like a way of making space for yourself and, and play, um, which is really yeah. important. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. I have a question from Alvin. He says, you mentioned five years ago, your work changed to better express your complex ideas. Was there a specific event that caused that or something else? Um, there, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, there were personal things that happened that drove me to want to do the things every day that I want to do. And, uh, and that involves experimenting to the highest. Mm -hmm. um, this might be kind of related. Um, Sarah says, considering your work on memory um, and what is real, is there a specific memory or piece of history you had in mind making it if it's not personal? Like if I if I want to make something and it's not personal, what how do I go about it? Is that the question? I think that's the question. Yeah, I think there research research. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are you know if I think if I think about um, you know colonial histories, for example, one can research you know at their actual photos of the ships that were the taking people. There are in the British archive you can have access to lists to rosters of the people that came. You know, there are these places that you find um, where you can gather the information more concretely that you would need to make some of the work. Mm -hmm. um, another question from Bianca, they say, as a culturally and racially diverse person myself, how do you find focus in your own identity when it comes to your practice? They say, I find it hard to express myself to others and show all I have to offer. That is definitely, um, you know, a characteristic of, of, of many, you know, um, immigrants and also people of, of diverse backgrounds. I think, you know, when I was a, when I was young, I found it very frustrating to not be able to communicate um, you know, some of the sort of otherness that I was feeling. And I think through art, like through representation, through, you know, having this voice now, um, it, it, it makes me less frustrated and more able um, to feel connected. And there's so many dis disparate parts, you know, the back, my background is so, just like many people, um, so complex, right? Everybody has this complex, uh, you know, are you from the South? Are you from, you know, wh whoever you are, there are these complex aspects and identity is not, you know, it's fluid, it's flexible. And so I think through art, that's how I am able to talk about it. And yes, it is frustrating. Definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, we have time for one more. And it's kind of a broad question. Um, <laughs> Bailey wants to know, um, what, what advice do you have for aspiring artists and students um, and I'll add on to that if, if it helps. Um, what advice would you give yourself when way back when you were a student? Okay. Um, actually, I have a quote to read. To end. <laughs> Look, great. I'm going to read this. Because I didn't really get to my conclusion. So there's a quote by Wallace Stevens that says, throw away the light, the definitions, and say what you see in the dark. I would add, make what you see in the dark. Trust your intuition, trust yourself. And I guess my advice is to, um, you know, to A, not compare yourself to anybody else because you are, you know, as an artist, a unique individual. You can't, com you know, artist careers are very different and happen at different times in your life. Mm -hmm. um, mine is just beginning, I'm 48 years old. So, uh, you know, it's, it's you can't do that. Um, and, you know, I just think you have to think very deeply and, and and or feel very deeply and you know think critically and and make work poetically and all of those good things so yeah 
I love that. Um, well, thank you so much again for being with us, for sharing all of your beautiful work. Thank you so much, Suchitra. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure.